Oh, at the end of every section, I'm going to hand out some excellence awards. Um, and we're at the end of the section. And this I would like to give to a brand called Cadis, which makes readers. And I ran into this brand in a store. I saw their box on a shelf, and it had like this long and rambling, passionate quote about anti-aging. And I was like, yes. <laughs> Um, and then I looked into it. I don't even need readers. My eyes are way too bad for that. But if I needed them, I'd be buying these. Um, so they, they say that they're the anti-aging brand. Um, that's our stance. We want to have an open and frank conversation with you about how absolutely right on it is to be the age that we are right here and right now. So, um, yeah, these guys, I, the reasons that I think that they are a great brand and fit this category are all these. They, they have an opinion. They're, they have great customer stories, very inclusive community. They infuse their brand into all their touch points, and they use unexpected copywriting. Like, their email address is help. I've fallen, and I can't get up. <laughs> That's pretty good, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Little one. <laughs> but you're going to remember it, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, now that we've looked at the authentic side of our brands, let's look at like who we're serving. And I'm going to assume that most of us know generally who we're serving. But this is more of a nuanced level of like how we're serving them and specifically what problem we're solving for them. Um, so there was a Harvard professor named Clayton Christensen that published an article called Know Your Customer's Job to be Done. And the thesis of it was um, we need to be making stuff, products, or services that people actually need um, and not spending so much time working on the user profile. Um, and how what products people actually need is determined by the job they're trying to get done in any given moment. Um, to illustrate this idea, he used this example. A um, developer outside of Detroit was having a hard time selling condos. They were nicely appointed, they were priced well, they were getting a lot of attention, but not many people were buying them and they couldn't figure it out. Um, so the developer hired a consultant who came in and interviewed people that actually had bought, and he put together a uh, customer journey. So how did they get from thinking about moving all the way to moving and buying? And what kept coming up was this um, talk of the dining room table. The things that were totally different in these groups were the demographics were all different, the psychographics were different, but this dining room table just kept coming up. And he couldn't really get his arms around it. It wasn't until he went home for the holidays and was sitting around his own dining room table that it finally clicked for him. He recognized that the people, that these dining room tables represented um, family. And the people that were moving into these condos were people moving from their family home into smaller space. And they had to figure out what to do with this very profoundly meaningful article and that was what was stopping them from moving what to do with the dining room table so as a result of this the consultant came back and told the developer well we need to offer make it easier for people to move they changed some things they offered uh, free moving services they offered two years of free storage and as a result of this, there was an increase of 25% uh, in sales, which was really good at that time. And yeah, oh yeah, this is not just a crazy stock photo, actual family right here. My grandparents and those are my parents a few years before I was even thought of. Um, another um, thing I wanted to bring up was or an so example of this job to, to be done theory when somebody is, enters the waiting room. Um, I have to admit that. For years and years, the detergent like motto was 
uh, get your whites wider and your brights brighter. That's what marketing had asked people, what do you want from your detergent? But that wasn't actually the whole truth. The marketing research had never asked, but why? I don't know if it's just me, but when I pull stuff out of the dryer, a lot of time, this is me. I'm stuffing my face right in it. Like how good does it smell? Like warm, fresh laundry. And in fact, it's the clothes smelling clean is what is almost as important to us as clothes actually being clean. Once they figured this out, the marketing language around detergent changed from the actual cleanliness factor to more like the, the smelling, what am I trying to say? The fragrance factor became really high. The freshness factor, that's it. And I'm thinking that I, there's a, another shift that I see in this now, which is, yeah, our clothes need to be clean. They need to smell clean. But also, like, there's a guilt factor in the, like, big plastic jug footprint, too. So I think that we're going to see another shift regarding sustainability in this regard. So when thinking about this, this concept, if you're removing the internal struggles that your customer has, it's going to help help their experience. So you're not just going to sell a house. You're potentially selling a fresh start. Career coaching, you could be selling outside perspective. Or website design is like a sense of confidence for a person, like legitimizing their business. Excellence award. I had like some other good stuff, but we're going to just <laughs> pretend we're just this. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like Netflix does a really good job with making it easy to interact with them. Um, they're like, free 30 days right in the door is great. I like how they give me the other stuff to look at when I'm like just browsing. Like they always nail it. I'm like, yes, I'll watch that. Um, the experience feels totally personalized. It's just frictionless. They make it really easy. And I feel like um, that is, that's good branding. All right, our last section is about um, developing content and design that's really courageous and memorable. I feel like you've spent all this time to build authenticity in your brand. Like the fastest way you can kill it is to use bad stock imagery. Like if you're talking about budgets, you don't need to show money or great ideas. We don't need to see light bulbs. Like try to think of ways to engage your audience that is a little bit like unexpected, more challenging intellectually. Um, yeah, it doesn't need to be so table stakes. People like a little bit of a mental challenge. So cluttered, busy designs are killers, using too many fonts, um, inconsistent iconography. So I see that a lot with um, Icons that look like they're taken from different places and they're all different style, like different widths. Um, so a consistency across the board on that is really good in your branding. Uh, poor alignment, like if you've got things on the page that are all like disjointed and they're not aligned in a grid, that can be um, not good. You can't tell what like you don't have a great distinction in your visual hierarchy that can be problematic. And of course you want like a great color palette. Yeah. Oh, I have some question about the, there are actually two of them. Sure. Are there too many fonts? I see, I do a lot of stuff on Canva and I have seen a lot of like pair these fonts that uh -huh. are pretty distinct from each other, but it would just be just two. Is that okay? like one that's more scripty and then one that's a little more. I think that's bold. totally fine. Okay. Yeah. Just not having like five different. Yeah. Fonts. Yeah. And then colors that clash, is there any, are there any tips for like, how, how do we, I mean, besides just me aesthetically being like, those look nice together. <laughs> like, I don't, you know, this is not my area of expertise. So I have, how do we know? Yeah. I, I mean, pair? color is subjective, right? Yeah. Like I might show something like this to my kids and they're like, uh, no, that is real ugly, <laughs> you know? Um, 
but there are great like palette sites that you can yeah. go to that can give you like good combos. Yeah. So there's a lot of tools yeah. for that actually. So like here's an example of a couple of different style of fonts here. Um, and these are both service-based businesses, websites. Um, like this one on the left, I feel like has a good uh, visual hierarchy. Like you know the sections that go together, they're sized appropriately. Um, I don't think that it's like radically creative, but like they haven't killed their credibility with this. Uh, whereas the other one, I don't really know where to look first. I feel like the, um, the imagery is questionable and appropriateness. Um, the fonts are really hodgepodge. Um, these are both financial services businesses. Um, the one on the left, I like because it feels like they're leading with their why, like make life better. Or better. Um, I like that it feels like you want to spend some time here and poke around. It's not visually like taxing to look at that. Whereas the one on the right, like I just want to get in there and get out of there as fast as I can. Like I don't want to explore. I just want to get the information and move on. All right, so we've talked about the visuals. Let's talk about some copywriting. Um, and there's a slight distinction here I'd like to make between copywriting and storytelling. Um, I feel like copywriting is language that you're using to try to persuade somebody. So like a email header or subject line, um, like headlines in general, your sales page. Whereas storytelling is like the objective of that is to connect on an emotional level. And that's going to happen in spaces where you have a little bit more room, like your LinkedIn posts or your About Us page, your newsletter, places like that. Uh, I've got a few copywriting definitions here. Boring. A lot of boring writing going on out there. Um, <laughs> These are two little blurbs I grabbed off of LinkedIn, and they're both the same job, but they sound very different. Uh, the first one is professionally certified executive coach. Um, the second one says executive leadership provocateur. I pour gasoline on your leadership spark. If Rick Rubin and Wendy Rhodes procreated, I would be their manifestation. So it's a lot, but you know that there's some personality behind there. And you know you're going to get somebody who's got an opinion. Um, and I like that. I like to know what I'm signing up for. Um, unfocused copywriting is bad. <laughs> Excessive jargon. Um, that's You're going to lose people with that. Nobody likes the heavy sales pitch. Rambling, meaningless headlines, and lacking a compelling call to action. These are all things to avoid for sure. Um, so when thinking about writing content for LinkedIn or your newsletter or whatever, um, this is a great reference point. Um, Donald, Donald Miller started a marketing consultant business outside of Nashville called Story Brand. He's got tons and tons of training materials online, great books and very accessible places to learn from him. Um, and he really talks about being the guide, not the hero in communications. So your business is the guide, right? Like you're Obi-Wan to Luke. And the way that he structures this is this sort of framework. Um, and a lot of blockbuster movies follow the same framework. We can put Barbie or Oppenheimer into here. Do we have a preference? Barbie. <laughs> All right, let's do Barbie. Oh. <laughs> so Barbie, she's our character, her problem. She's not perfect enough for Barbie land. So she meets ugly Barbie. No, weird Barbie. Weird Barbie, right? Yeah. Basement Barbie. <laughs> um, and, and basement Barbie, weird Barbie, tells her, you're fine. You just got to own it. And that's really her plan. So she goes out into the world and um, 
she discovers that she's a okay the way that she is and she is fine with owning it and she comes back and helps lead a revolution of people that are just as empowered as her basically like that's the nutshell version no spoiler <laughs> <laughs> um this is another one of my favorite books um regarding great writing. It's called Made to Stick by Two Brothers. And they teach you really how to write so that your stories are sticky. And by sticky, they're like sticky like urban legends are sticky. They just kind of plant themselves in your mind and they're very shareable. And that's exactly what you want with your brand, right? Um, so this is the checklist that they use for stickiness. Um, an example is this. If JFK would have been a uh, CEO of an aerospace initiative, he could have said this. Our mission is to become the international leader in the space industry through maximum team-centered innovation and strategically targeted aerospace initiatives. What? That's <laughs> really not What? But he said, our mission is to put a man on the moon and return him safely by the end of the decade. That, you can remember that, you can share that. And that's an example of stickiness. The curse of knowledge is something that we're all, uh, it's like a cognitive bias that we all have, we forget about it. Like if you're talking to somebody and using too many acronyms, my CPA does this to me all the time. I don't speak in tax code and he is just yammering on and on. My eyes are glazed over and not having recognition of that curse of knowledge that he has, he loses me every time. So it's an important part of like communicating with our audience is they don't know what you know. So you got to make it sticky and you got to make it simple to remember, right? <laughs> um, this is the last award I was going to hand out. It's to a canned water company called Liquid Death. Their tagline is murder your thirst. <laughs> they, um, it was started by this guy who was an ex-director um, at Netflix, I believe. And he really wasn't seeing in the marketplace any sort of water that spoke to him. Like it was all white and blue and in plastic bottles and he wanted to see something that really represented him right i think that another co-founder was trying to stop drinking and he didn't want to bring his little uh, plastic water bottle in he wanted something that kind of looked like a beer um so this company is worth 700 million dollars now and i think they were super disruptive to that um, market because they came in with a real personality. That's why I give them the Courageous Excellence Award. I had a great ad here that I'm just going to have to look at online. <laughs> Identifying your why is really beneficial with your branding. Really clearly flying your flag high, really own it. It makes a big difference. Um, being the solution for your audience, like removing the anxiety and make it really easy to engage with you and tell really great sticky stories um, that people want to share. So that, those are the takeaways really from today. Um, this is a list of resources that if you download the PDF, this stuff is uh, linked. So just click around and it'll take you to the right places. Um, and there's a QR code where you can download it from. But um, other than that, I'm happy to, if anybody has any comments or questions, I would love to. Yeah, yeah. you're welcome. Mexico City was at school. I go to Mexico City all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you do? It's in the neighborhood P, I, I want to say Paloma, but Bola, I know. Oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> My sister used to live there, so I don't oh, know. Oh, really? Nice. The place that did I give you the name is called Shinu. Shinu? Shinu. Yeah. Okay. No, it's X I N U. I think I should have wrote down all kinds of ideas. So yeah, good. Good. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. You're welcome. Cool.
Well, my question about the storytelling. So, if you sell a product as opposed to a service, mm -hmm. is your story about your product or the person who needs your product? I mean, it could be either, right? I think that people like to connect with people. So, so under, under the best stories are the stories of like alignment or people seeing like themselves in you, right? So how how did it make you feel or how does what's the benefit to you, right? Yeah. I mean, how how. I love a good origin story. Like um, how brands are built. Does anybody listen to that podcast? Oh, how I built this. Yeah, no. yeah, he's so yeah. Great. That's really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I love that one. So good, guy right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I've bought stuff from that that I had um, really didn't like want just because I like the, the origin story so much. So. Yeah. How important is it to have a singular brand? First, so my business is mostly business to business, but mm -hmm. our, we make a product that um, laboratory users or um, analytical chemists to use, but we sell to distributors. We mostly sell wholesale. So, would it, there ever be a recommendation to have a brand that is facing to our wholesalers versus facing to those end users, which we never sell directly to those end users? Mm -hmm. Or is it better to have just a single brand that both of those people see, even though they approach us differently? Yeah, it's a good question. I feel like there's a lot of businesses that kind of are straddling that line of like, I don't know, I want to kind of serve both. I think that probably my gut says go for like your wholesalers, what what would make their lives easier? Um, but that's just my instinct. 